thank you for inviting me for this talk. Um, so um, I'm a dietitian in Glasgow, and I work mainly in the New Victoria Hospital and the Southern General, which is the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Now, before I start, can I ask how many of the audience here are actually the uh, patients? And how many of you are carers? Uh, and how many of you have seen dietitian before? And how many of you are on a special diet or any dietary restriction? And how many of you are haven't seen by dietitian but on a special diet? No, right? Okay. So um, when the question asked is always when we have newly diagnosed with a condition, always we will ask ourselves: Are we doing the right thing? Is there anything else I'm doing can improve the condition? Or is it okay if I eat certain thing? Or if I eat certain thing, would it improve my condition? And then the last answer is always Google it, right? Um, so <laughs> here we go. Now today, the main topic, I realize there's quite a lot to talk about for lifestyle and diet. So just summarize it by talking a little bit about lifestyle, and mainly about diet. Um, and then we will have some briefly talk about the nutrition supplement and medication. And there'll be a bit question time for everybody. So lifestyle. Now, as we know, um, we prefer people, to everybody, to be at a healthy weight range. And also from earlier presentation, I believe um, you were already told uh, avoid excessive weight gain. That will be good for your blood pressure. So how do we know if our weight is within normal or not? So um, everybody know about the BMI, um, which is your weight in kilogram divide by your height in meter. So if the answer came out from here, it's your weight, your BMI is within the green zone. That means your weight and height in the right proportion. And that means you're at a healthy weight range. However, other ways to find out is if we measure if you're a gentleman and your waist line is around <laughs> more than 40 inches, or if a lady more than 35 inches of waistline, then it may be worthwhile to consider to lose some weight. Because according to the British and Irish Hypertension Society, if you can lose around 10 pounds of your weight, that will be benefit to your blood pressure control. And also, um, if we can reduce the alcohol consumption, if you're drinking more than the recommendation, or even you're drinking within the recommendation, a little bit less, to compromise a little bit, then <laughs> um, also that will help the lifestyle changes. Moderate exercise, according to the NHS Life, live well. If you are over 65, which are not many of us here, I recommend around 150 minutes of exercise, aerobic exercise per day. And does anybody know what is aerobic exercise? A very easy way to distinguish aerobic and anaerobic is if you are doing exercise and you can still chat to the person next to you, that is aerobic exercise. And anaerobic is the other way around, as you cannot imagine a weight lifter with talking to the person next to him. So those are anaerobic. Okay, now um, I have got a list of things which is diet related and the IJ nephropathy. But today, mainly I will talk about salt intake because it will be more general advice for everybody and also coincide with earlier presentations with the um, blood pressure control. Okay, so let's start with cholesterol. Um, as we also know earlier from earlier discussion, IgA nephropathy, uh, good cholesterol control, is more to do with the control the condition rather than improving it sometimes. So we would say if we can have a diet with lower cholesterol, lower saturated fats, that will be a um, ideal diet. Um, patient may be on statin, and also we will recommend dietary wise, avoid anything with too much animal fat, which is the lovely white parts on the bacon, um, lards, which we don't use many nowadays, but um, also um, like the chicken skin, or the fatty part. And we will encourage people to use more vegetable oil and less oil if possible, so as to help weight reduction. Now, energy and protein requirement. I couldn't find a good picture, but what I was I'm trying to tell everybody here is, as a dietitian, we will estimate how much energy and protein a person is needed. 
And most of the time, we got a rough idea according to the uh, British Renal Association guideline. But um, that is a r rough idea because, as you can see, people can look the same and um, weight the same. But their daily activity is different. Their health condition could be different. So the requirement could be different. And we are just giving a general idea. That is, if your body mass index, BMI, is within the normal range, for your height, in proportion. Then you use your weight to times 30 to 40. Then you will know how, man, how much calories you will need a day. For the same, if for protein requirement is around 0 0.8 to 1, you need to multiply your weight. Then you will know your requirement. Now, how does it work? So, for example, um, there's a 65 kilogram person. Height is 1.7 meter. And the BMI will be 22.5. That is within the normal range of 20 to 25. So the protein requirement of the person will be 0 0.8 to 1 times 65. And the protein requirement of the day of the person is around 52 to 65 grams a day. Now, this is a very abstract figure. You know, it doesn't make sense to most of the people. And our job as a dietitian is to convert numbers into food. So that is roughly we will look at the diet to see, are you eating enough or are you not eating enough? And as anybody have seen a dietitian before, see myself before, you know that when you come into my room, I will interrogate you and ask you around 2,000 questions and what you eat, how much you eat, when do you eat? And so as to have an idea about what you are doing and whether you are doing <coughs> the right thing or not and give advice accordingly. Now, why is it important? Because when somebody has got kidney disease, it is not so simple that it is um, what you should not eat. But also, we need to make sure your well-being. Lots of the renal patient um, we come across will say, um, I don't feel very well, but we don't know what's exactly wrong with them. Or I'm off meat. Uh, food doesn't taste the same anymore. Or I don't feel hungry. This is always what we heard. But when somebody said, they are not eating well, we need to find the reason why they are not eating. Is it because um, they feel nauseous? Are they in pain? Or is this a side effect of certain medication? As you know, renal patients' medical medication list is a mile long. <laughs> and is any medication newly start and put them off from eating properly? So we would need to know the reason of not eating. Is there any medication side effect cause them taste changes? So they don't think food tastes the same anymore or have they got depression or any other comorbidity like diabetes or um, uh, heart failure, cancer, anything else, which all coincide and will affect their quality of life. So when we are looking into a patient's diet, we will taking all this into account to make sure the patient is eating well and not malnourished. And then um, it is not because somebody came to a dietitian and said, I haven't been eating well yesterday, and we will call it we will call the person malnourished. There are clinical guidelines to tell us what we meant by the patient is clinically uh, malnourished, and these are some of the lists here. Okay, and we would depends on the patient's um, reason of not eating. We will give advice accordingly. Um, maybe increase certain kind of food they like, change the palatability of certain food. However. It doesn't always work for everybody. So in that case, um, no, we will prescribe some supplements for the patient if needed. Has anybody here ever had any supplement? Yeah. How was it? <laughs> was it good? <laughs> yeah. OK. Those are usually what we'll recommend. OK? Now, main topic today is about salt. Now, how much is too much is always our question. Now, give some facts first. Average British diet, we consume around nine grams of salt. And we know that men consume more salt than women. And um, the recommended daily intake is around six grams of salt. What is six grams? A teaspoonful of salt is five grams. So just a little bit more than a teaspoonful. And we also know that processed food contain more salt than the non-processed one. So for example, um, Pork is okay, but gammon steak will be higher salt content. This can. Now, another thing um, will be quite useful is um, look at the food label. Now, uh, food label, as you can see from the further end, sometimes it's 
is shown as gram of salt. So then you know directly how much salt is in certain portion of food. But sometimes it's shown as sodium. So you may find what is the relationship? Sometimes people ask, so if you multiply the sodium by 2.5, that will be the salt content of the food item. And as the re recommendation said, we recommend six grams of salt a day. So if you eat three meals a day, you expect per meal, we recommend around two grams of salt or less per day. So when you look at um, food labels, then you have some idea what is good and what is bad. And our actual body sodium requirements much lower than we know. Um, for example, here we said the sodium requirement is only this amount. So the salt requirement per day is only less than 1.2 grams a day. Now, this is a rough idea. For example, if the person has been running, jogging, sweating, has any diarrhea, vomiting, then the, of course the requirement is different. But general idea is only around 1.2 grams, and the daily allowance is six grams. So definitely, you know, we, we are getting enough salt in our diet. And the therapeutic diet, you may come across something called um, low sodium diet, low salt diet. Therapeutically, in renal patient, we recommend no added salt diet. What it means is you can still use a little bit of sea salt in cooking, but no more at the table. So that will make up the amount. And we do not recommend low sodium, low salt diet because the palatability sometimes doesn't taste good for long term. So we, it is difficult to keep up with such a low potassium diet, a low salt diet. And also it is not necessary. Okay. Now, so why we restrict the salt intake? I think earlier, maybe some of the presentation this morning already mentioned is if we have too much salt, our kidney cannot get rid of the extra salt and the salt will remain in our blood and our body will try to retain more fluid to dilute out the salt. So in that case, we got more blood than we should. And our blood pressure goes up, heart have to pump harder, and that will also cause other problems, which is include out of breath, swollen ankle, and um, some cardiovascular disease. Now, I spent lots of time yesterday to look for pictures, to picturize this one. So here is breakfast. For breakfast, if someone have a small bowl of cereal, one slice of toast with one slice of bacon. I couldn't find any picture better than this one. Snack is um, maybe a packet of crisps. And lunch, jacket potato with cheddar cheese, some salt to go with it, and oxtail soup. Evening meal, fish supper, some salt. And supper before go to bed is a cup of holic. Now, it's quite a typical diet sometimes. How much salt do you think is in this daily intake? Any idea? Would like a guess? Hmm? 10 it is 12 grams salt for a diet like this. Right, so it does, and also, um, as you can see, f if you go to a fish and chip shop, it won't be one little sachet of salt. They will give you <laughs> probably a little bit more than that, okay? Now, if we change the diet, the bacon change the jam, the packets of crisps become biscuit, and the oxtail soup become um, apple juice or something like that. And the uh, cheddar cheese change to cottage cheese, and use pepper, mayonnaise, and orange, uh, lemon juice instead of salt. Then um, how much salt is in this diet, do you think? It's two grams. Really? Yeah, it's a dramatic drop. So uh, as you can see, in change your diet can dramatically change the salt intake. And if it helps to take less tablets, it's worth trying. So um, how to achieve um, salt restriction? First of all, don't add so much salt in at the table and in the cooking. And also um, avoid salty option of the same food. Now how to explain this? It's like when you are buying tin fish, for example, tuna in brine will be higher salt compared to tuna in spring water. Or you can look for good quality meats and sausages rather than smoked bacon. Some simple things. But you can also use herbs and spices, anything you want, except salt. That will dramatically change your dietary salt intake. Anybody have heard of this? 
Yeah. And as you all know, we don't recommend any of the renal patient to use it, right? Because of the instead of sodium chloride, the usual sea salt, it is potassium chloride and it's very dangerous to our patients. So we do not recommend at all. Now the next thing is potassium. Anybody here is on a low potassium diet? Yes. And anybody here can tell me what kind of food is high in potassium? Exactly. It's actually <laughs> it's here, right? Okay. Now, um, the easiest way I always try to teach my patient is anything which is colorful that is high in potassium. Why? Because you will know it later. Why? <laughs> no. So, um, do you really need a potassium restriction, or um, what kind of food should cut out when your diet? It all depends on your blood result. It is not always because uh, you have got kidney problem you have to go on a low potassium diet. Because um, a person can be tall, bigger, or thinner, smaller, less muscle. And also the, they may get rid of some potassium themselves, depends on different stages of the kidney disease. So our decision on whether you need a low potassium diet or not simply is based on the blood results only. So if your blood result is good, we will not say a word. Okay, but if the blood result is, for example, pre-dialysis, potassium is about 5.5, then we would suggest you to go on a low potassium diet. Or if you need to start some blood pressure tablets, which we, um, some doctors mentioned earlier, then even your potassium within the normal range, we would suggest you to go on a low potassium diet. And potassium is for muscle contraction, and so if you got too much potassium in your body, you may have a cramp, which is not a big deal if you, you know, just scream a little bit and rub your feet. But your heart is made of muscle. So that's why whenever patients have high potassium, the hospital is always quite cautious and I call the patient back, do another blood test, check the medication, see the dietitian, and change the diet if needed. Okay. And also we would try to emphasize one thing is if somebody is has been on a low potassium diet. It doesn't mean the person has always need to go on a diet because again, the same thing. Potassium restriction is depends on the blood result. So for example, if somebody hasn't been well for a couple of weeks in the hospital, not eating at all for a long time, and their potassium goes below normal, then at that time, actually, we will push the patient to eat some potassium containing food. So. Potassium is always depends on the blood results and the appetite in this case. Okay. Now phosphate. Anybody heard of that? Anybody on a phosphate lowering diet? No. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, so what kind of food is high in phosphate? On the picture. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, now, why I said potassium is fr and colorful? Because phosphate containing food, the easiest way to remember is something white in color. That's what I always tell the patient. So think of food like dairy products and meat. Okay. Your egg, milk, cheese, yogurt, chicken, fish, all the red meat, all the seafood. And um, we will say anything which is um, protein usually comes with phosphate is a package. And anybody know um, what is the consequence of high phosphate? Itchiness, yeah. And also cardiovascular problem. That means um, how to explain it here. Now, I always explain to patients phosphate, how to remember it is a good friend of calcium. Because calcium is usually a bit more famous. Lots of us heard of this. But phosphate may not. <laughs> so um, we will say if um, a kind of food which is contained phos of high in calcium, usually it can be high in phosphate. And also in our body, calcium and phosphate are next to each other most of the time. When the blood phosphate goes up, it will start to melt the calcium from the bone to pair with it, so as to just stabilize it. And then in the blood, because you've got more calcium and phosphate, they will start to deposit on the soft tissue, which is supposed to be like blood vessel, the valves, inside the heart and also the heart, and change a soft tissue into bones. So it will increase the risk of heart disease and vascular disease. That's why in initially, the person would just complain, oh, I feel itch. That is not a big problem. But in long term, it is the heart and vas 
vascular problem that we are concerned about. And we will keep nagging the patient if anybody here already yes, got nagged by me for all these years to reduce their um, phosphate intake. And we will, there's a fine balance to make sure a patient is eating less phosphate than they should. And also they are not malnourished because phosphate containing food is protein food. Okay, right. If we have tried everything to change the diet, but the phosphate in the blood is still high, then the doctor may prescribe one of this thing, which they have phosphate binder. And we will, as a dietitian, we will suggest you to distribute according to your meal pattern. Um, one thing I came across, particularly about IgA nephropathy, is omega-3 fatty acid. Um, as a dietitian, I have to say I don't usually recommend it for patients. And also ask about ask my colleagues about their opinion. Um, we do not recommend any fish oil and also um, over-the-counter cod liver oil, those kind of things, because they are usually high in vitamin A. And in renal patients, sometimes the vitamin A is in their body will goes up, so we don't recommend. And also, there's no conclusive recommendation of how much a patient should have. Instead, we may just say um, they can have some uh, fatty fish, like salmon, mackerel, tuna, maybe a standard portion, rough, roughly five ounces, two times a week, three times a week, that would do, rather than consider to get some extra fish oil. Other things in dietary-wise we would look into would be like um, earlier Dr. John mentioned, uh, steroid. If a patient needs to lose weight because um, they got room f to improve their weight, then um, on steroids make them more difficult to lose weight because of the appetite. Um, it's very the appetite can be very well, and also um, if they got diabetes problem. If a patient is on insulin, we always need to look into when was the last time they seen by the the GP, the doctor, or the diabetes specialist nurse. Any adjustment of the insulin will always help them to reduce their appetite and also to preserve their kidney function. Anybody heard of this DASH diet? No, no, right. So it's a dietary approach to stop hypertension, which is a diet recommend with high fruits and vegetables. And because of that, the patient's blood pressure improved. And that is um, beneficial to blood pressure controlled. <laughs> However, it's, we have to be quite cautious about it for the uh, renal patient. As you know, too much fruit and veg may not always recommend if you got a um, hypotensive problem. Okay, and sometimes we heard of the low protein diet. However, it is not necessary to go on a very low protein diet. If a patient is eating huge amounts of protein, maybe reduction of a little bit, will improve their symptom. But we do not recommend any very low protein diet, for example, like 20 grams or 40 grams of protein per day, because um, the patient is a little bit marginally will be malnourished. Okay, so I think I've covered most of the thing I need to ask. Thank you very much. <laughs>